Welcome to Professor Sky's Spam Channel, where I discuss anything that is not new music, and where once a month I try to feature one YouTuber. I don't really do this just to say like, gee, wow, I like this YouTuber. I do it with the mind of thinking about future academics. As I will get into in this video, academia doesn't really understand YouTube. Academia isn't paying enough attention to it, but in time they will. And when they do, they will need some better understanding of what's been going on. And so as a real deal academic myself, doctorate, tenured professor, all that stuff, uh, I think I can help to add to that discussion, that future discussion, by saying what's happening right now in 2022. What makes different YouTubers good? How does the platform function? How is discourse being had? Why is YouTube the most important place for human discourse, perhaps in the history of civilization, certainly at the moment. <clears throat> so today I'd like to talk to you about Zoe B. I wanna talk about why she is something of a personal hero to me. It's, it's weird when uh, you have someone who can be a hero that's much younger than you. You know, it's like, like when you see like 50 year old dudes like really excited about like 19 year old baseball players. <laughs> like, dude, just calm down. But still, why she's somewhat of a, of a personal hero to me. Why I think she should be a personal hero to all college professors uh, or even just people in the humanities. And at the very end, I will tell you one or two things I don't like about her channel. And, and one of them is really going to bug most of you. So that, that's my little tease, my incentive to keep you there. Now, I discovered her work through the work of a different YouTuber, uh, ThoughtSlime. Eventually, I'll do a video on ThoughtSlime, if I can ever forgive their propaganda for um, doing drugs. It annoys me. <laughs> um, but the thing that, that, before I sort of get into more specifics, the overarching reason why I think Zoe B is so important is that she's contributing to this left-wing discourse. Uh, she's doing a very good job of it. She's bringing her own perspective, which comes from academia. But what most, what's most important is that I think she does perhaps the best job of infusing empathy and compassion into her work, which if you pay attention to the things that I try to highlight, that's what I think is the most important. That's what I think is the most difficult. That's why my music channel is always positive, as an example. Uh, because negativity is very easy. Negativity gets clicks. Negativity makes money. And the entire system is built up to create negativity, to create division, to have us be fighting back uh, against each other. And I think she might be the best example of somebody who's using compassion to forward deep ideas. So I'm going to roughly structure this video. Um, she edits her videos. I don't edit my videos. So it might be a little bit rambling. I'm going to start off with like three things in basic that I think are great. Number one is just totally personal. She has mentioned that she's from West Virginia. Uh, uh, my brother lives in West Virginia. I really like that state. I find it interesting. I have a niece uh, who is who's actually worked on like Appalachian studies and she's shared some of that with me. And I think it's very important that we recognize and we celebrate people who can come from West Virginia and can contribute things to the larger world. It is a very alienated country, uh, country a very alienated state. Uh, at times it suffers from anti-intellectualism, at times it suffers from great poverty and misunderstanding and derision. Um, so I, I, that's just one thing, you know, that so much of the online debate is dominated by Canadians. <laughs> My theory is that it's because they have healthcare, they can afford to be YouTubers. Uh, or it's dominated by coastal elites like myself or, or other people who, who become coastal elites uh, and not really sort of from this part of America, which is not that well understood. Also, side note, uh, if you read Robert Byrd's biography, uh, the most famous West Virginian politician, uh, Ku Klux Klan member who then went on to be the best voice against George Bush, interesting guy, uh, my, my father is in that book all over the place. My father was a, was a chaplain at, at West Virginia University, and he was a great enemy of Robert Byrd. So that's fun. <laughs> if, if you're a West Virginiaite, you probably own that book. You can find that there. But that's kind of neither here nor there, although it does influence some of the things I like about her videos. Um, the, the cultural and academic analysis is almost always at what I would consider to be the highest level. You know, so I sort of have like a, have a sort of tier system in my head of the depth of conversation. The lowest is, are the people who watch other people talk about the thing they're talking about. And then the highest are people who do original research. Her videos are almost always at that very highest level, which I think is very important. And I'll get into that more when I talk about her specific videos. And then on a sort of personal and professional level, 
Her story illustrates the greatness of academia and the absolute horse hockey, the dregs, the garbage of, our, of academia, the failures of academia. You see, our origin story is not that different. I mean, she's much younger than I am. She comes from less privilege than I do, uh, I, I would assume, um, in many different ways. And what's interesting is that she started this channel <clears throat> And she started it basically right after getting out of grad school. So she went to grad school and she TA'd and she, that's where she learned that she loved teaching, a teaching assistant. I did the same job at Santa Barbara when I went to school there. And then she got a job at a community college. Now, I teach at a four-year liberal arts college. I never name it. I don't represent it. That's that. Uh, but I will say that um, a lot of my students come directly from community college. Uh, at times, uh, the school has... Uh, basically the same population as a, as a community college. So I, I very much relate to that level of academia. <clears throat> and I love that she started her channel because she teaches Monday, Wednesday, Friday. <laughs> so this is a funny thing, you know, like people often will ask me, how can I be a full-time tenured faculty guy who's also the chair of his department and also do three to four videos a week? Well, it happens to be if you're not at Harvard, you're not at Yale, you're not at BU, you're not at Northeastern, you're not at any sort of major school, you don't have that much uh, publishing pressure on you. I had to get tenure and I got it. And ever since then, I've dedicated all my extra time to this channel as opposed to reading articles and writing articles. So she had that same thing where teaching is this great job, college teaching is this great job, and you do have this certain flexibility. So, you know, when I first started watching her, I felt really connected and I, I like I, I screamed at my phone thank you like academics like I tell all of my colleagues like just start a YouTube channel it doesn't matter I had under I had under a thousand viewers for the first you know hundred thousand under hundred uh, under one thousand subscribers for the first like year and a half of doing my channel I was doing videos with, like 30 views like week after week after week after week but it was so good. It was so meaningful. Because this is the thing about academics. We're given all this information. And usually, you know, we're sponsored by the state or sponsored by a college to become a teacher and to get all this information. And you learn everything from the smartest people that have ever lived. You learn all of it. And then you scrape and you fight and you push and you elbow and you try to do good interviews and you try to have the best CV and you fight as hard as you possibly can to get put in a position where most often you're not going to get to teach the things you want to teach. You're not going to get to teach those high thoughts. You're not going to get to discuss the complexity of Roland Barthes in my case or Rabelais in my case or any number of great French writers and philosophers who I don't get to talk about. Instead, I teach French 111, 112 for the most part. It's great. I love teaching 111. I love teaching 112. The way she describes it, she loved teaching English 111, 112. But you're stuck. And you have all these thoughts. You have all this passion. You've dedicated yourself to a life of the mind. And nobody cares. Nobody. You know, I mean, you can infuse it a little bit here or there. You can keep publishing to a small audience or give talks to smaller audiences. I once gave this amazing talk. It was a 20 minute talk at the Northeastern Modern Languages Association. It was on uh, the presence, the, the depiction of French suburbs in French hip hop music videos. I worked on it for like 100 hours and I presented it literally to nobody. I was literally in a room and only the other panelists watched my talk. That's the life of an academic. That's like the positive side for most academics. So every academic I see, I say, just start a YouTube channel. I don't care if you're not funny. I don't care if you're not cute. I don't care if you don't think you have anything to say. Just get it out there. Because the other thing is, YouTube needs Zoe B's. They need Professor Skies. There is a authority deficit. Sorry, I got paint on. I've been painting the nursery. So I got paint on my hands, sorry. I'm not, trying to be, I'm not trying to affect like I'm a cool artist guy. I'm just painting poorly. Um, there's a deficit, an authority deficit. I mean, 
there's a lot of great YouTube commentators out there, but for the most part, most of them graduated college and played a ton of video games and are the smartest people that might be in their group, you know, like they might be super smart people, but they haven't gotten all that information firsthand. They haven't actually done all this work. That's why some of the most interesting YouTubers are uh, PhD program dropouts, you know, because they at least got into that world. But we have a whole group of people, young people, mostly college age and younger people who are fiending for real information from people that they can trust, who are dying for real information, who don't actually only want to watch reaction videos to PragerU and Ben Shapiro. They actually don't want that only. They want something more. So Zoe B, with her degree and her history of teaching in college, and as far as I'm concerned, she could have been teaching at Yale, okay? Like, people who teach at community college are 100% real teachers, and they do more work than most other professors do. They just do. I have a lot of friends who have taught in community colleges, and I can tell you this from experience, right? Like, that needs to happen. Because right now, as far as I can tell, there's only one high-level academic who's ever figured out YouTube. And he uses it totally for evil. I'm not going to say who it is. But you can probably figure it out. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not going to say. So here we have this figure. This is why I say she's a hero to me. Because, you know, I mean, my, my, my music channel does pretty well. You know, like I try to do basically the same thing she does, which is take my academic information, filter it through a fair amount of compassion, and then use that to talk about new music, right? Um, but she has a huge audience. She has like 170,000 subscribers. And people really follow her. And she's like, she's like Johnny Appleseed with this human, this very, very humanist, very, very compassionate take on all these different topics. But also, she's a sign of the failure of academia. You see, she talked about her career as an academic, and then a year later she revisited it. And in that time, she had left her job because she was an adjunct. Do you know how badly adjuncts are treated? The thing about the, re the reason adjuncts are treated so poorly, and I know this because I'm now a chair of a department, it is now my job to find and employ adjuncts. I have to tell them how much money they get. It is embarrassing. It is embarrassing. It's totally out of my control, but it's embarrassing to like find these people who are smart, dedicated, motivated, and want to teach, and want to take care of it, and the difference between them and me sometimes is just luck. I have to tell them how much they're going to get paid, but that's not even the worst part. The worst part is that we're in this weird super capitalist system where education is now based on delivering assessment results. It's now based on standardization. It's all based on flattening to the point where everybody has to teach the same thing everywhere all the time. Especially, the lower the college gets in its reputation, the more the squeeze is put on those professors. I don't have freedom. I have not had freedom over my own curriculum for much of my time teaching. And I'm a tenured dude. Like, I, in theory, I should be, I should have all the freedom in the world. But that's not the way that the system works. And so she left. And I don't blame her. She was forced to teach in a bad way. And instead... She gets to reach sometimes millions of people with all those thoughts that were up in her head. And now she gets to get them out. And we are better off for it. Had she continued in academia, you know, maybe if she continued on to get her PhD, she would have written essays for a limited audience. She would have struggled like hell to get a job as good as mine. Um, and my job is often very difficult and unrewarding. She would have been just sort of in this weird sort of grist mill. So... It's very nice seeing this, this, this person who takes all that knowledge and actually uses it to actually reach people in a way that they actually understand. To go back to my training, La Fontaine, who wrote a lot of the fables in the 17th century, insisted over and over again about the importance of pleasing and instructing. Plaire et instruire. <clears throat> and very often, academics and scientists, everybody, they consider themselves to be above pleasing, that that's below them, that if anyone needs to be entertained while I'm teaching them, they don't deserve to learn. 
That's not how it works. Two side notes on this. One, she mentioned what it was like teaching in COVID. And I, she might see this video. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a Patreon of hers. She responded to a thing. She seems pretty open. Um, she needs to do a video <laughs> about teachers in COVID. I'd gladly appear <laughs> um, because she pointed something out that people just don't understand about COVID and about first responders. It's great that we're totally, totally giving all this credit to the, to the delivery workers and, and, and to the grocery workers. They need it. But teachers, we were on the emotional front lines of this thing. Like the amount of human tragedy and trauma that I had to deal with. I mean, I'm glad to do it. I'm happy to do it. But I'm talking about people saying, I can't buy the textbook because I can't afford it, because my aunt who I live with just died of COVID and also my mom who I visit sometimes has COVID and I don't have Wi-Fi in my building. Stuff like that. Like stuff where I have to sit there and think like, how do I pass the student who hasn't done the work? But also, you just got an A. <laughs> I'm sitting here and I'm talking to these students for like an hour, two hours about their life and trying to say the same thing that Zoe said in her video over and over again. There's more important stuff than this, this like need for compassion. So I don't know. At some point, maybe she'll make it. Maybe I'll make a video about it. I don't know. <laughs> but the, the COVID experience, the fact that we went through national trauma is not fully understood. And it, I really think it's the teachers who might understand the impact on the youth the most. Because it was terrible. I see my students now and I don't know how they got here. I don't know how they did it. I cannot tell how the hell, if you are between the ages of 16 and 30, how the hell did you make it through? I just don't know. Second note. <laughs> hey, like George Soros or like somebody like super rich, why have you not started a YouTube university? Like, why is Yale not trying to get contra points to teach there? Why is there not a bidding war for FD Signifier to run a department on sociology and race? Like, how stupid are the smart people in this world? They're not paying attention, you know? Like, all these people are out here delivering, how does Zoe B not have an entire English department that she can run? Seriously. I'm not joking. I understand she might not have a PhD. She might. I don't know. She's never mentioned having it. But this is the person that you need. So if you're some bumbling college or you're at some small school, you have some kind, how do you not try to bring these people in? Because they've already proven they know how to reach people. They've already proven it. They know how to please and instruct. Anyways, I don't run the world. I can't, I can't, I can't even get my college to keep their French program. <clears throat> what do I know? <laughs> you know? I don't know. Uh, when it comes to her style and her approach, I've talked a lot about uh, compassion. Obviously, she describes it as compassionate critical analysis, which I do think is a very important skill and a skill which is not taught very often and a skill which is not often featured and it is a skill which is not often remunerated financially. So the fact that she can live off of her YouTube channel while having it based on compassion and not snark is important because kindness and intelligence should go together. If there's one thing all that like atheist, you know how the whole atheist community is what turned into the alt-right? Like any kind of like super belief in your intelligence and all that, a lot of the stuff on the left, I'm thinking in particular of the debate bros, but other people as well. A lot of the people on the far left, they get so in to being the smartest people in the chat room that they lose that empathy. So that's the, that's the real uh, emphasis there. Also that she's very careful not to be prescriptive uh, in her approach. So like she's not sort of trying to tell you how to do things. And when she talks about the way things are, she describes them as they are, not saying that's the way they should be. I'll get more into that soon. Also just, you know, we need communicators. Like we, that's what we need. You know, my wife is a scientist, um, and she talks about people like Bill Nye. Like you might not know this, Bill Nye is not much of a scientist. He's not. Like he's fine. <laughs> like I'm, like he, he whatever. He didn't lie about his qualifications, but he's not like a scientist. He's a communicator of science, and because of that, 
he's able to reach people and do things that the world really needs. He's a great force of good. Humanities also needs communicators. We don't just need people saying no one reads and no one cares about books and just getting kind of angry about the, the failure of humanities to, to be seen as relevant in a, an increasingly inhuman world. But what she's able to do is be a great communicator. And that's another thing which I think we need a lot more of, not just on the left, but in the humanities. So let's talk briefly about the subjects, the things that she likes to talk about. One of the videos that interested me the most very early on was about white trash food. This, this video is brought to you by Easy Cheese, by the way. Um, I, I, uh, I eat a lot. I used to, in high school, so I'm a French professor, so I can tell you, I have like working knowledge of over a hundred French cheeses, you know, like I can describe them to you, where they come from, what kind of cheese they use, how long they're aged for, that kind of stuff. Maybe not a hundred, like 50, but like a lot of cheese. Like I'm a cheese guy. I, I used to teach a class where I would bring in cheese and give it to my students until they started canceling my classes that had less than 12 students. But I used to eat a lot of Easy Cheese. And her essay on white trash food is a great example of this compassion. It's a great example of this importance of understanding middle America or understanding Appalachia. And it's a good example of the kind of work that she does of really breaking in and finding places of derision, finding places of dismissal, finding places where people are made to feel less than, <clears throat> and really emphasizing the ignorance that's behind it, the cruelty that's behind it. As a college professor, I really appreciated her essay on grading is bad. Uh, I don't agree with all of her conclusions in that, and I don't know what to do because I also would prefer a world without grading uh, because ignorance is its own, its own punishment and knowledge is its own reward. Uh, but that's, I think, her most successful video. Sorry, I got, I got Toby over here. You're going to see I'm a big hypocrite. Toby, are you going to say hi? She always has her cats in her videos, so you get to be in this one. Oops, sorry. Um, so her video about, about grading being bad is very useful. I think it's very necessary, and I think that it's the kind of thing where it might actually have a change going forward because I can talk about grading being bad and I can cite all of the studies that she talks about, but she congeals everything and puts it together and again, communicates it really well. I also re recently appreciated a video she did about puns, about the value of puns. That's very tied into the white trash food. You know, it's a thing, like when you have authority, like what do you do with authority? And she has a lot of authority. Everybody who has 100,000 viewers on YouTube Hell, everyone who has 42,000 subscribers on YouTube has a certain amount of authority because people care about you and they listen to you and you are authoring what they're listening to. So the fact that she spends so much time on things like this, right? Because she could spend her time explaining, I don't know, Mallarmé or some, some great poet or, you know, like, like she, she could. She could go like very deep into some kind of very deep, difficult... Uh, poetic analysis of, of some great poet. <clears throat> and I would like that, and that would be good. Uh, but, but, you know, that's great, because what you're doing is you're, you're talking about things that are above what most people know about, and then you're bringing them up. But a lot of academia, a lot of the sort of more intellectual world, has spent too much time punching down at things that are beneath. And, and that's not so much like the smartest people. <laughs> Like, very, very smart people don't punch down. Like, you'll notice that. Like, if you're ever in a room with somebody who is scarily intelligent, they're never going to make fun of anyone else for being unintelligent. They're just not. But there's a kind of, like, middle class of academia, <laughs> a sort of, like, large group of people who like punching down to make themselves feel like they're at that top echelon. And the things that they look down on are things like easy cheese. Because cheese is difficult. It is. <laughs> and they look down on things like puns. So she provides this huge analysis of why puns work, why they're funny, what function they serve, uh, like in a neurological fashion. She explains what function they serve in comedy. Some of her takes on comedy, I, I don't know. I just, so there's a guy named Henry Bergson who wrote a lot about comedy, and I feel like people don't talk about him enough in the English-speaking world. So I don't know, maybe... Uh, Maybe I'll do a video on Bergson someday. Uh, but this whole video about puns 
is her at her best. That might even be the best example of her work if you're a future academic watching this because it really shows this effort to valorize and validate things which are overlooked. And this goes back to that Appalachian thing as well. Like when you come from West Virginia, you come from the place that is literally the butt of the joke of all the surrounding states. Like that's, that's just what happens. Like, like you are seen in a certain way and if you recognize that West Virginia is not like worse than anywhere else, human beings are not worse, right? We're all human beings. Uh, then I think there's a, I think there's a spillover from that. Interesting things she talks about, like how to speak to conspiracy theorists. Uh, she is able to distill it quite nicely and about the ideas of the way that she says it requires respect, facts, and time. In particular, it's that time. That's the kind of thing where I can watch it because I've thought a lot about discussing with conspiracy theorists and all that because that happens a lot online. And the idea that she emphasizes this concept of time is quite interesting. Her work on the literary canon it's funny because she really talks about what is literature and what is the value of the canon. This is a, a case where I think what she's saying is very useful, but also I don't always agree with it, but that's, it's a whole other question. Because uh, when you're trying to teach literature, and, and I have been trying to teach literature most of my adult life, when <laughs> we have to find a middle ground between just dead white dudes and no dead white dudes. Like we have to somehow find the middle ground and we're just not quite finding it. But the reason I like that video is that's where she was able to bring in scholars like Harold Bloom and Terry Eagleton and, and guys I remember studying in, in grad school uh, and just being able to see sort of how she's uh, putting those together. Much like she attacks puns, she attacks Grammarly, she attacks a lot of the general conception of what is accepted as right and smart. And again, she's using her authoritarian her authority, her power to help the people who feel less than for liking puns, for not having good grammar, and instead changes the perspective. And she also spends a little bit of time talking about you know, Shapiro and Prager University, and I like those videos of hers. Um, but that's just, I mean, she does it as well as anybody does it. Okay, so like there's an entire Ben Shapiro industrial complex on YouTube. And, and there are people who are just mediocre people, <laughs> just, just mediocre thinkers, mediocre speakers, mediocre video makers who have made a living off of talking about Ben Shapiro. And, 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 and there are great thinkers, great video essayists who have also made a career off of talking about Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson and, and all those people. So I don't falter for having those, but those are definitely the least interesting aspects. Um, I do like also that she, she mentioned this book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman. Um, this is one of the most important books in my life. And I've not, I haven't even finished it. I've only read the first third, uh, but my wife, who I've mentioned already once now and is much smarter than I am, much of her thinking is, has been helped by that book and she infuses that book everywhere in her life and then I live with her and I've infused her thoughts. So I'm a very Kahneman thinker, even though I haven't even finished that book. Uh, but that kind of shows the perspective that she's coming at. I said I'd talk about the things I don't like um, she, does, she did say in one of her videos that being an English major is not a good idea professionally. She then went back. She then went back and said that's not true. But oh my God, I almost didn't do this video because that still bugs me that she said that because <laughs> it's just not true. If you're a college student out there, the diploma is what matters, okay? The diploma is what matters. That's what's going to get you a good bourgeois life, all right? Just get a diploma. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be something as useless as communications, as useless as French, as useless as biology, as useless. That's all useless. Every degree is useless. It's all useless because it's not about getting, you're not there to learn how to fix motorcycles. You're there to get an education. So whatever it is that you do, if you go to a liberal arts college, do what you enjoy doing because you're going to do that at a higher level. And don't worry, if you get a college degree 
and you have a good work ethic, you're going to be able to have a good, happy, bourgeois life. You don't have to major in something that your parents understand is putting you on the train tracks to Successville. There's no train tracks in life. You think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study nursing because then I'll get a job as a nurse and then I'll have a nursing job and then I'll be comfortable forever. Except 60%, 50% of nurses wash out after two years. So what did you do? You wanted to study English, you wanted to study French, but your parents said you have to get a job at the end of it. So you got a job at the end of it, but then it turns out you can't handle being a nurse and now you don't have an education, you just have a diploma. Anyways, she went back and corrected that. But definitely, definitely get a... If you have the inclination to get a degree in philosophy, get a degree in philosophy. You will be totally fine. I don't always like her skits. I find it interesting as a study because very clearly she doesn't quite know what to do with her intelligence. And I think she wants to seem more uh, diffident than she is. I could be wrong about this. But uh, it seems like she sort of writes in mistakes into her videos so that she seems more relatable. And because I feel like I see through that, I feel like she doesn't need to do that. But maybe she does. I mean, she's a much more successful YouTuber than I am, so maybe she's figured out. You know, whatever it is that gets people watching is what matters. I do think that in 10 years, in 20 years, if she keeps this up, she's going to be one of those figures, like, like, I don't know, like Bob Ross or... Mr. Rogers or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, like, like one of these figures, like a very likable, kindly, or Bill Nye, a very likable, kindly person that people look up to. She's too young right now, so, you know, she has to wait till her hair gets gray and whatever. Um, I mean, people don't take women seriously enough. People don't take young people seriously enough. And people definitely don't take young women seriously enough, right? So all those things all kind of match together. Um, but she... She does have that ability. So I think, hopefully over time, she'll feel a little bit less necessary to sort of act like she doesn't know what she's doing or to leave those bits in, but I don't know. The final thing I'll say, I don't like the cats. I'm sorry. I just, I don't like, I don't like the cats. It's like, it's a big thing. I know a lot of her success is on the cats and I just showed you Toby and I show Bo and Toby all the time on this channel. So I'm a big hypocrite. True story. I've had one cat in my life that I loved. Krusty, Krusty the cat. He won $5,000 on America's Funniest Home Videos for a video of him meowing to a harmonica. I didn't make the video. I wasn't told about the video or America's Funniest Home Videos until after Krusty had died. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Someone made the video and you can look it up. Look up Singing Cat Rocks Out to Harmonica. I'll put it in the description as well. That's my old cat. That's Krusty. Found him at the, at the, Oakland, at the Oakland pet shelter. There's the, all these other cats and he was just this nasty, gnarly cat. I'm like, if we don't say this cat, he's going to be killed. I don't really like the cats, but I do like the specter of her husband. I do like how she often, yeah, Toby, I'm talking about you. I like how she talks about her husband vaguely as a very supportive and kind force. Um, I know as a wife who in my channel is a very kindly and uh, vague force. I really do like that. There's not a lot of family people in this whole YouTube space. It's mostly young single people living young single lives and uh, I really appreciate that. So, like the husband, I could do without the cats. I'm just not a cat person. I'm allergic. I'm allergic. That cat, I was allergic. That cat probably took years off my life. <laughs> so, anyways. All right, Toby, you have to make me seem more likable, would you? Huh? Would you make me seem more likable, Toby? Huh? Smash the like bucket and uh, subscribe if, if, if you like Toby. All right. Well, anyways, I hope that was interesting to you. Uh, oh. I really hope that you uh, check out Zoe B's videos if you haven't checked them out or if you have checked them out, check them out more to really appreciate the level of quality work that she's doing. Okay, until next time, there's the camera. Toby, where is the camera? Oh, you wanna go outside? You wanna go out on the porch?